Well, here we go. This is going to be Zach Brown's version of the David Letterman Night Show or something like that. <laughs> and uh, here we are, beautiful Indianapolis with two legends, uh, heroes of mine growing up. Sorry to date you, but we do have kind of a theme here. Uh, Mario Andretti and, and Johnny Rutherford, um, both McLaren drivers at one point in your career, and McLaren Indy 500 winner. Yeah, yeah. And um, so we found this unbelievable motorhome that McLaren had here from 1972, we think through about 1980, based on some of the stuff we found in there, which we'll talk about. But, um, well, so first of all, thanks for, for joining me. I think I've got the coolest job in the world, which is to work for McLaren and be able to hang oh, yeah. out with you guys. Um, so this is quite a privilege. And I thought one of the things we talked about is Bruce. Obviously, I've never met him. You guys knew him, you raced with him. And I don't think enough people know about Bruce McLaren. So maybe Mario, I know you uh, won races with Bruce. What should we know about Bruce? You should know that he was one of the nicest guys in our business or anywhere. And besides being, you know, a great driver, specifically a technical driver, obviously that's why he started a team, you know, he wanted to be his own manufacturer. And, um, you know, his success is immense. You can see not just uh, Formula One, but Ken M. I mean, he just dominated. He was the envy of everyone. Even, you know, he had to really put it all, put it on all this competitor, even by showing up with something like this, because nobody had this, <laughs> Yeah this, yeah, this type of convenience, you know, at the track. So, uh, again, but uh, I got to know Bruce very early on uh, in my career because uh, we were both part of the uh, Ford Le Mans program in, in the 60s. And, uh, and as fate would have it, um, I, I was so, uh, you know, interested in every way to do as much running as possible, uh, testing and everything with Ford. And of course, Bruce was there quite a bit most of the time, you know, based on his uh, uh, schedule as well. But uh, I gravitated toward him because there was so much I wanted to learn because I think I had the high speed pretty well nailed, you know, com by comparison. But I needed to learn the technique and the slow corners, you know, the, which is very special, obviously, in road racing. And uh, there's no one that would rotate the car beautifully better than Bruce McLaren in that respect, and stuck on a very technical man. And uh, I remember whenever he would take his turn in a car, I would be buzzing out on a scooter and uh, go to any of the key corners and watch what he did, the line, when he put power on and everything. And, uh, and then we'd have dinner at night. And uh, what would we talk about? Racing, <laughs> of course, <laughs> you know. But um, again, uh, I'm just so uh, privileged that I had the opportunity not only to race and as you said, win with him. We won the 12 hours of Sebring with the, with the brand new Mark IV, you know, in 67. And then, you know, of course, uh, later on, once I, uh, I started doing Formula One full time, uh, you know, in 76 and so forth, uh, I, I asked uh, Roger Penske, you know, if he would have a car for me on the odd IndyCar race that I could do between Formula One. Sure enough, and he had a, he had a McLaren there, you know, he, he, he was, that's what he was fielding at the time. So I had that experience, you know, throughout a couple of those years. And, um, and, and again, you know, we won a couple of races. Uh, we didn't win here, you know, but uh, we won a couple of races along the way with it. So um, uh, I can say, okay, I had some experience with McLaren. Not like this guy here who won here, well, but uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, I look back and and I, I, I feel privileged, you know, quite honestly, that I had that kind of relationship uh, with Bruce because uh, what he created in motorsports, I mean, is legendary, as you know. Yeah, yeah. And as you say, you know, you're very proud to be part of that as CEO of this company. And um, uh, so again, uh, I'm fortunate that I go way back, you know, knowing, you know, the real guy. Yeah, yeah. And, and he had, <clears throat> that's one of my regrets is it, that he was, killed in the testing accident before I came with the team. He was killed in 70 and I came on in 73. And, uh, but he had, he had good people running his operation. Tyler Alexander was, was 
you know, very good. He was, he was, you couldn't stump him. He knew what he was, wanted to do and how to do it. And uh, he was good to, you know, I could, I could talk to him and he could talk to me. You know, that's, and that's the key to any success in a race team is, is communication. And, uh, but Bruce, I, what little I knew him, he came here in what, 69 or when the turbine that, that uh, Shelby brought to the speedway. Oh, anyway, I met him then and he had his, his formula, his cars here. And uh, he was, uh, you know, they were a little behind the curve when they came here. Yeah. But it didn't take long for them to catch up. To figure it and, out. Uh, I had, uh, you know, I had always told my wife Betty that if I could ever find anybody that wanted to win as badly as I did, I, we'd be winners. Yeah. Well, McLaren hired me in '73, and and uh, that was it. You know, I just, I I couldn't believe it. We came here to test, and the car understeered terribly. You know, we we went three or four days, and it we couldn't stop it. And uh, so I took it away and came back and uh, it, here in May and uh, I took the car out <laughs> and immediately after a few laps knew that I could go flat footed all the way around here without lifting. And we were the first unofficial, to, unofficial team to go 200 miles an hour. Yeah. We thought we were gonna break the 200 mile an hour bracket and uh, went out and set a new track record of uh, 198 something, but had one lap at 199. And it was, you know, that was it. You know, it was just on down the road. It was 74 or 76, which was your favorite win between those? 74, those two. because I wrestled with AJ for so many laps during yeah. the event. Yeah. You know, it was, uh, I, <clears throat> I can say this now, I couldn't have told him then, it he hit me. But I, if I kept, he might still try to I kept you. him in. It kept me in his rearview mirror and pushed, and shoved. Uh, I could run him out of right rear tire, or something would happen to his engine. He had the V8, uh, four cam Ford, and uh, sure enough, it lost an oil line, and it just covered me up with oil. I had to back way off from him to keep from getting covered up so much, and. Uh, but anyway, it, that was that you know not just because it was my first one, but because of that event with AJ during the event. Was Revson your teammate the first year in '73? First time, yes, '73. How was he? Quick. Old Revy. He, he, yes, he was. But uh, I, you know, I often wondered uh, why he wasn't quicker, or his, you know, his car as good mm. as mine. And I think it might have been, but I, you know, I'm an old sprint car racer. Mario and I come from sprint cars and midgets and everything. So we take up a little slack, but it's, you know, no, he was, he was good. And it was sad what happened to him. Yeah. Yeah. What, when, um, was Bruce like Colin Chapman at all? I know obviously Colin didn't drive, but from a engineering cleverness standpoint. Well, he knew his engineering. I mean, the, um, uh, he, he understood the dynamics, aerodynamics, suspension dynamics, and all of that of the car. And that's a, that's to me, that's what was the envy, you know, just even uh, looking at uh, when I really would have given anything, you know, to drive one of his Can Am cars, the contemporary, because uh, the closest I got, you know, we all, I always drove, I mean, a lot of Can Am, uh, a McLaren Can Am cars, you know, that uh, Ford would feel him, but. We could never even have the second year. We all, I mean, the first year, we always had a two-year-old car. <laughs> and then, then I'm looking at what he had, the improvements he made from year to year and watching, you know, suspension and everything. And uh, he was right on, you know. It was just uh, uh, so many, you know, not just Bruce, but, uh, you know, Danny Holm, uh, Dan Gurney, you know, whoever would get into one of those cars, you know, would have an opportunity to win. And many... Uh, the drivers won that, you know, so he, he, they were dominated on that. So he was the envy, obviously. And um, as you could see that uh, he just knew how to make a car work. He just, as I say, you know, uh, Colin Chapman, obviously, uh, you know, on the other side, as you asked, 
a great engineer, you know, and the best part about Colin, which was different, Colin kept throwing stuff at you just to get your mind stimulated. Just so, you know, somewhere out of 10, you're gonna pick something. Yeah. That's the way it was Colin, that Colin yeah. was. And, and I thought that worked for me because he said, you know, I would explain, you know, what I'm looking for. And I had some ideas and then, and then he'd throw it, ah, okay, we'll try that. You know, yeah. that type of thing. Bruce was much more on it, not too much, you know, to, you know, throw straws up in the air. You know, he was much more technical and, and I, I got to see how valuable he was, you know, in setting up uh, those sports cars, those uh, prototypes that, that Ford, this was a massive event, you know, I mean, the effort that Ford put on for, for Le Mans. That's why they were so successful because they brought in individuals like Bruce, you know. Uh, a lot of people don't realize how much he contributed you know, to that, and of course he benefited too, you know, he won the Le Mans and then, you know, Sebring together. So, um, again, uh, he was just one of those very rare uh, individuals that can really, he could be a great businessman, you know, in putting together the team, first class, everything that he did. And the other thing, you know, you, you mentioned Tyler Alexander, you know, just, yeah. just one, just for one. Sure. And I, I, I work with Tyler, you know, with, with Newman Haas, and I've known him for many years. He always surrounded himself with the best individual spot, which is, you know, actually the secret, you know, in any secret business. Secret of success. Secret of success, but, but he did that. Yeah. So anytime you picked up somebody from, from the McLaren bunch, you know, you knew it got somebody good, yeah. you know. And, and Teddy uh, Mayer was. Teddy Mayer, yeah, right yeah, there yeah. At the I same mean, time, you, right? you name it, you yeah. name it. I mean, he had the right people around him, you know. Um, in, in all the different areas, you know, the specific areas of, uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, there was uh, no such a thing as jack of all trade, you know, you had, you know, whoever is uh, specialized, you had people specializing in all the different departments, and, um, and that, that again, that, that's what was uh, a success. Yeah. Um, again, he was bigger than life to me in so many ways, because personally, I benefited personally you know, from his existence, uh, even though, again, you know, just unbelievable competitor, as we all know, uh, but at the same time, because of the way it turned out, I benefited personally from his knowledge, and, uh, and the fact that he was uh, so ready, you know, to discuss all the small things. We had, like I said, some of the conversation we had was golden. It was golden. I come away from dinner or something, I said, man, that was the best dessert I ever had. Yeah. Just a couple of pointers that he, told, that he would tell me. You know, so uh, he was that kind of guy, but uh, uh, just a cool dude. I mean, really a nice, nice person. And then so you guys were teammates. Cause, so in the bus, yep. when we went through it, we found all this cool memorabilia. One of them, you yeah. guys were teammates, 1977. Trenton Speedway. Trenton Speedway. That was a lovely place, wasn't it? Yeah, I used to love Trenton. I yeah. went six times there. Wasn't bad, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Does it still exist? What is it now? I have no idea. What is it now? Apartments? Uh, I think it's probably that or leveled or who knows. And then in 77, you also won in uh, Atlanta in the McLaren. Yeah. I think that was our last IndyCar win. You might have, yes. And then? That M24 just didn't, wasn't quite an M16. And then we found Mario's uh, timesheet from Long Beach, 1978, oh. not driving for McLaren, but nonetheless, you were still the fastest at a lap time of a 138.9. And the next guy, Carlos Rodeman in the Ferrari, was a half a second slower. Well, that was good. That was, uh, that was very good. <laughs> that was a cool yeah. car, too, that, uh, the uh, Lotus. The, uh, well, you guys know all these guys, but uh, Bobby Rahal, which was funny because Oliver Askew, our driver, didn't know. And he went, damn, I didn't realize Bobby's that old. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to tell that to Bobby. Uh, he, he was less on the pace. He was uh, five seconds off of you. I think I'm going to have to show this to Bobby, <laughs> see what excuses he has. Uh. And then when you won an Indy, there was this cool pull out pulled out well i've never seen that yeah. that's something with the 
I drove one of those. And then the M23. Yes. And you raced the M23 or? With, with Emerson, yeah. Yep. yeah. Which was cool. And then, um, yeah, so this was the owner of McLaren engines. So it would have done the, we've got some cool photos of Peter Revson in it. There's oh. some stories about James Hunt and some things he's probably done in it. Which probably adds some value. I'm surprised it wasn't in the movie. Uh. <laughs> and then what's it like to see, kind of coming a little bit more current, Marco on pole? Oh, goodness. Uh, happier than I've ever been here. It's amazing. Uh, I wanted to see that so badly. Uh, and, you know, he's been around for quite a while and somehow you know, he just had to pop over center to yep. get the yep. confidence that he could really beat the best. And this past weekend he did two days in a row uh, under trying circumstance, you know, as far as, uh, you know, everybody had a fight with, uh, 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 you know, with the elements and such, you know, but uh, I was uh, so surprised because, you know, I was just uh, telling Johnny, you know, and uh, when, when we were driving, uh, you know, it was a pressure cooker as it is, you know, but you only have one chance to do it, you know, and now the way the new qualifying system is, you know, if you're going to do it, you got to do it twice yeah. at least. So, and to do that, I got to give these guys you know, a lot of credit, you know, got to get it up yes. twice. So we know what it takes pressure wise and everything else. And um, so, you know, to answer your question, I'm over the moon, uh, you know, and I don't know if I'm probably happier than he is, <laughs> because you know I, I wanted I wanted to be good for him. I wanted the, the, this uh, this career to to be something that he will be proud of the rest of his life. And and he's still you know he's still young enough. He's early on, and he could be a late bloomer yeah. in that sense. Because looking back, a lot of bad breaks, and I don't know why. You know, driving like with a black cloud over his head, just like my, uh, my son Jeff, for instance. For instance. Yeah. But I think yeah. uh, the sun is shining, you know, all of yeah. a sudden, and uh, hopefully that's going to be the case. Well, no one's ever going to be able to take pull away from him. And yeah. like well, you said, having to do it but twice. But in, in so, he did it in such a great way, you know. And, and at the end of the day, he had to beat the best guy, you know, really, uh, Scott Dixon, that IndyCar has to offer at the moment, you know, all around. It's, and... Um, cool guy too you know and and again and then the camaraderie that some of the other drivers showed i thought was something that was really very it was heartwarming fun watching the penske guys getting yeah. all yeah, excited I know, I know. watching i know it was uh, so uh, i've seen you know we spent a few days together now just uh, relaxing you know before we got here today and uh, you know marco he's he's really relaxed you know and, and he's got this quiet good. confidence you know and, and again, we'll see what happens, but um, the team has also really come around. They've, uh, they've stayed the course. Uh, that's always a great sign too, you know, yeah. not just trying to try to pull, uh, you know, some uh, straws out of the sky, you know, and, 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 and hoping for, you know, for something to uh, magical, you know, these cars can only give you so much. And, and I think he was around the sweet spot and he stayed there, which, uh, it's almost rare to some degree, you know, and that's perfect. That's perfect. So, you know, to um, you know, to answer your question, I'm as happy as could be. But I, I, I gotta tell you a side note, you know, uh, Johnny, Johnny and I, uh, I want a Formula 5000 race with his helmet on. Oh, did you really? I had, yes. That's why. Why? <laughs> I, I, had the, I had the star on the helmet. You know why? We're in Riverside, and uh, I'm on pole, and and my helmet was on the seat, and somehow, as they were pulling the car on the grid, somebody lifted it. Did they? Oh. So I get ready, you know, after the national anthem, you know, I get ready to. So where's my helmet? I don't know. I don't know. Oh my God. Oh my God. You know. So, <laughs> and I don't know what it was. You know, Johnny had some problem with the car, so he, he didn't start the race, and I said, Johnny. You got a helmet. He says, helmet, it didn't fit. He's got such a big head. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, he didn't see that. You <laughs> don't was, stand a chance. It was, uh, you know, his shield was really dark and all that. I said, and uh, so I said, you want a road race? Yeah. <laughs>
That'd be a cool helmet to get. I'd like to get that yeah. for my collection. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the, this is the Texas flag. and. Uh, because yeah, uh, you always ran the star. Had the star, yeah, the yes. Star, that, yeah. that was, yeah, it was Lone that, Star. The Lone, lone Star, star was with my helmet, and here yeah. we win the race. Do you remember where you were when you heard about Bruce's accident? No, or I you don't. remember hearing about it? Oh, I remember. I remember hearing about it. I mean, it's, um, it's yeah, one of those tragedies, you know, that when the shock. Test it was testing, a shock. Pure shock, you know. Testing and knowing that uh, he certainly would never do anything foolish, mm -hmm. you know, it just got caught out, you know. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, sad, 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 sad. It was as sad as could be. Yeah, yeah. never, never expected, uh, especially in a Can Am car and one thing or another, you know. Uh, but um, you know, just a perfect storm, yeah. you know. Yeah. And then Johnny, did you ever want to go race in Europe? Did I, I? I mean, Formula One. Did you ever that? No, I. <coughs> ever of interest? I was too busy running. I learned and came up in sprint cars. Yeah. You know, I ran the fair circuit. They called it IMCA, and uh, ran dirt tracks of all descriptions. This guy was really, really good. One you of know. the best. Yeah, it was. Uh, I was actually. A we were teammates. Did you guys race against yeah. each other in we dirt? One, yeah, we were teammates. Cars, yeah, teammates one time, and he had the car I won the championship yeah. in, and I had Wally, Wally Muskowski's new car. Yeah, which you could pitch at the start finish line, and it wouldn't get side bite until it hit the front wall in the first <laughs> turn. You but know, I, I remember we went up in the air. Oh you yeah, know, although oh, I was yeah. uh, actually, I, I was. You know, I was on track, and and he was just. Oh, gyrating. Oh, you were oh, ahead of goodness. me and picked yeah. up a rock and hit me right between the eyes. I've got the goggles that prove it. <laughs> I knew I could blame. I knew I could blame. <laughs> How tough was Mario to race against? We were we were racing at, at Eldora Speedway, and uh, uh, I was driving the, the new car, running about third or fourth position, and Mario was behind me in, in the Wally's other car. <clears throat> and... Uh, Wally came out and, and gave me the move up sign. You know, I thought, well, he sees something that I'm, I'm missing. So I moved up and my partner here just goes right by me. Well, we can treat that lap. <clears throat> and I gave Wally the signal of what I thought of what he'd done. <laughs> and and uh, we go into the, me up. Yeah. <laughs> 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 into the first turn and uh, it was it was a rough track, and the thing you don't do when you commit yourself is back out of the throttle on a rough racetrack. And and uh, something, I had just put my flip shield back on my open face helmet, and it, it hit me right here. My goggles are just shattered and split, right here where it hit. And I, you know, gained my undivided attention, and I backed out of the throttle, and it hooked a rut, and flipped, and went up, hit the guardrail. <laughs> And uh, went way in, way high in the air. I mean, you know, it was, and then it was 60 feet down from the guardrail to the bottom where the Ooh. creek was. And so I'm going in for in pretty violently. <clears throat> and the next day I was in the hospital, Betty had the Dayton Daily News paper, and the sports put that picture right on the you know, front page of the sports. And and I'm hanging out of the car as it's in the air like this with, with both arms up. up there, he's saying, not and, me, not and me. The, <laughs> and the guy, the guy back captioned it, Rutherford waves to the crowd as yeah. he leaves the racetrack. <laughs> he's upside down, he's just stressed out like that. <laughs> Unbelievable. Oh, but yeah, that was, he's that a friendly was, guy, you know. <laughs> that's sprint, that is sprint car racing, you know. But that, isn't that how you met uh, Betty? No, I met her was here. She I, oh, met her I thought she was a nurse. Yeah, there. no. I you met probably her here. met her while you were convalescing from another one. No, I was. <laughs> I <laughs> didn't convalesce very much, you know. All right, I got the story wrong. Bad story. Yeah, <laughs> you, a, you're you're missing for with somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> Did you guys know James Hunter? Well, you must oh, have known yeah, James. Met him. Yeah. Yeah. Had met him. Oh, and, I knew and, James uh, really well. Yeah. Is he quite the character that he appears oh, yeah. in? Oh yeah, yeah. He was. He was an interesting guy for sure. I mean, yeah. Great guy to be around in so many ways, um, and a hell of a racer, no mm. question about it. I mean, uh, you can't take that away from him. Uh, he was one of the great characters of our time, you know, oh, yeah. and he made his mark for sure. 
Um, it's just too bad the way it went for him, you know, but uh, nevertheless, you know, he, uh, he was great and, uh, you know, if I had the opportunity to race with somebody like that, it's always something that's very precious. And Emerson, you raced on both sides of the pond. Yeah, for mm -hmm. sure. But Emerson actually um, took the ride. I couldn't, uh, there's, uh, in 69, when there's a couple of races that I couldn't make. So uh, Colin gave Emerson my ride and he impressed him so much that they, he kept him on the team. And when he won his first championship yeah. in 72, I think. Yeah, was. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, cross paths. I mean, another thing, um, in 79, 60, 79, I couldn't, it's one, the only time I missed the race here, and, uh, and I was driving for Roger Penske. So, uh, Rick Mears took my car and he won. <laughs> so, <laughs> Rick and Thes thanked me, you know, thanked me that I, you know, I couldn't make the, yeah. the show and so forth. So. Um, you know, it's amazing how things happen along the way, yeah. how you touch, you know, different lives, how we one another cross over an event or something, um, you know, can be very meaningful, you know, uh, again, you know, I was, uh, I look back in my career, how some events because of either misfortune or something with somebody else, where it became, you know, my opportunity that if that wouldn't have happened, my goodness, okay, uh, now what? What, you know, where would I have been? Or how, you know what I mean? Where do you go to the next level and all that? I think uh, in my own life, I look at three or four key events. And in one, Roger Penske has something to do with it. Because, mm. uh, you know, when um, Chuck Hoss got hurt in, uh, in, in uh, New Bremen, I think it was. Yeah, New Bremen, the sprint car, yeah. The sprint car. Uh, he was driving for the Dean Van Lines, and that was one of the top three teams in IndyCar at the time. And the guy, there was uh, between, somebody was pushing for me, you know, this is in 64, for me, they, you know, to give me a, a try. And somebody else uh, uh, had uh, Roger Penske, you know, why don't you get him, because Penske was a candidate. And all of a sudden, you know, Penske probably had a seven billion dollar deal somewhere that he had to do, yeah. <laughs> and he was busy. And uh, so they said, well, he, he couldn't do it. So it was a test going to be in Trenton during the tire test. Yeah. And um, here I am, you know. Yeah. And um, and actually, the car, uh, the roaster that I was driving, uh, had a racket. They put a rack and pinion steering on it. It was a lightweight, and uh, nobody had driven it yet. They thought they had the, the, you know, the cat's meow, the rack and pinion, you know, but the, but saw that axle. They didn't realize that it, as the car went down the straightaway, the wheels were going like this. <laughs> so yeah. here I'm on this roadster, and I, go, I, I have I have I have a tough time keeping it straight on the straightaway, let alone the corner. <laughs> so I'm out there wrestling this thing, and and uh, so these guys say, "Hey, kid, you know what the heck?" I said, "I, I, said, I don't know." I said, "Man, this." It's tough, so they put Roger Ward in there. Yeah, yeah. They put Roger Ward. Roger went out there. He took like a half a lap. He came in. And says, he said, "This kid is either the stu stupidest kid in the world, or he's the best guy I've ever seen." <laughs> you know, to do several laps with that thing. <laughs> so it, it, it was funny. Ultimately, after that, then they put a conventional steering. You yeah. know, usually a long arm. And then, you know, the thing really came alive and that roadster actually was fabulous for me. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I did a few yeah. races in 64, but going back, if Roger would not have had his situation, I would have never got that, that ride. Yeah. So where would I have wound yeah, up? You yeah. know what I mean? So that, that, all this <coughs> another one of those yeah. events. The older we get and we have the opportunity to think back on all of the things that we've been through or done or have mm -hmm. happened to us, and you, you see, see that it's like, you know, the thing just came together, comes together yeah, like that. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. why, you know, and you don't realize it at the time. Another guy that would have been like Bruce, Jim Hall. Jim Hall, right? Oh, yeah. Great yeah, guy to drive good. for, yeah. you know. But he, engineer, the thing was, driver, inventor. He, he yes, he he yeah. was good to drive for because he had been a driver of of note himself. Yeah. So he. 
you could talk to him. You know, yeah. you'd say, hey, Jim, it's doing this. And he'd think for a minute and he'd tell the guys, hey, do this and this and this, and it'd fix what you were talking about. So he, you know, he was, uh, he was good. And it was fortunate that I had Steve Roby, uh, with, who had been at McLaren with me uh, over there. And, and they butted heads pretty hard quite a bit. But Steve was finding things that with the car and, and really, you know, that car got here, what, seven days before the 579, and, and it was brand new. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's, that's not much time to, you know, to put a car together and get it right. It had all the features, though. I mean, it's a uh, cool know, looking car. He, yeah. uh, not only that, I mean, uh, that's what Jim Hall always thinking outside the box. I mean, yeah. you look at the yep. innovations that he came up with, yep. you know, aerodynamically and so forth. Um, uh, he loved people like that, you know, individuals like that that contributed so much to, you know, the advancement of, uh, you know, and tried to be to get the speed out of these cars yep. and, and realizing, you know, uh, the downforce, you know, that was everything. Yep. And um, and his way of putting down force was the best way. Put wing right on the uprights, you know. So you you know it was in the unsprung push way. It down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. push it down directly. You didn't have to stiffen the car. So the cars were you know high speed. They were and then with, they were soft enough. They would be really cohesive through the slow corners. You know, in fact, you know I drove the Lotus, uh, you know, in uh, with the, a high wing, yeah. you know, back in '68. You know, it was just. Um, uh, interesting times, you know, you, you can imagine. Yeah. Jim Hall was right there, you know, one oh, of those yeah. innovators. Yeah. Did yeah. he also come up with the slick tire or is that someone else? What's that? The, the slick tire. Was that Jim Hall? No. no that, that, was, that was a Firestone and... and no, uh, I'm going to tell you the story about that. <laughs> <laughs> tell you the story about that. We were testing here. It was uh, just coming up to Christmas. You know, we used to test almost right up to Christmas. And, um, you know, uh, Firestone and Goodyear, and th this was in 1969, uh, and in uh, no, 68, and Firestone and Goodyear, they were um, always, you know, they bring slick tires to the track and then do engineers who used to do a lot of their own grooving, you know, thinking this is better, more grooving, less grooving, half, half you know, the, the, you know the, the pattern. And um, and so uh, we were we were we were testing uh, construction, and uh, one of the engineer, Al Clark, you know, he says, you know, we got one set that we wanted to test. He said, but we didn't have time to groove it. And 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 I went out, <clears throat> and he said, but be careful, you know, because it's slick. <laughs> I went out there right away, man, and I set a track record. Yeah. And. And so they contributed that to the construction, not, not thinking. Not having, yeah. So we went like another year and a half or two years without, you know, still, you know, a with roof tires. Yeah. And it's amazing. We talk about it. I, I talked to Al, Al Clark just the other yeah. day. Oh, you know, really? Yeah, yeah. yeah he's, so it huh. was really neat. And, um, you know, he's not, he's not doing well. Uh, but but um, anyway, uh, it's amazing. So that's you know, how that came about how that that was fun out. Yeah. Just like Stagger, you know, I found Stagger and that was Al Clark and Harry Davis, the two engineers from Firestone. Uh, by accident, you know, we knew Stagger in the midgets and sprint cars and so forth, never dare thinking about doing it, you know, on a super speedway. And uh, we were in, in 69, we were testing in Hanford, California. And, uh, and, so, and, and I had I always, always had the steering, the steering had to be centered for me. I was always very finicky about it, you know, because then I knew if the tires, you know, were just pressures or whatever. And uh, Hanford is a track that it was extended, it used to be a mile, and extended to a mile and a half, so, but the left turn one, the same small radius. So anyway, I go out with a, it was a, a really weird set of, of test tires. And, and all of a sudden I'm down the straightaway and the, and, and the steering is like this because, you know, the, the car had stagger in, but they didn't know. <laughs> and the steering is like this. So, uh, and I stayed out. I stayed out and, and the car was loose, obviously, but I was really quick through the Rotated tight radius, the yeah. turn one. Yeah. 
And then I went in and I said, uh, measure the rear tires. So they measured the rear tires and I said, leave it. So what I did, I put more cross weight in the car and you know, just tried to get the balance. And I went out there and, and I was quicker than any of the test tires we run, but this was not. <laughs> this was not the type tire. of tire to control, <laughs> not even control tire. Then we put control tires and, and, and I really, I went quicker yet. So uh, in testing, the one thing, the rule that was clear that you have to divulge everything and, and everything is shared, you know, by energy. This is one that uh, I, I said, you know, this one, I said, it has nothing to do, you know, with the technology of the tire. I said, you got to let me keep this one. You know, I got it for one race, which was the <laughs> next, Hanford was the next race a week later. I said, just one time. And uh, so here we go. I, I'm on pole and, oh, and Al Unser was with a new uh, Lola, you know, quick car was next to me. And uh, so two laps later, I'm leading. I'm just really pulling away right away. And there was Danny on guys had a huge accident. So they red flagged the race. Yeah. And I'm and and both cars are in the front there. And and uh, Parnelli Jones, you know, who owned the, the Lola is walking around my car and he's looking and then, you know, it's like, you know, they, they tried to look. <laughs> and I said, you won't find anything unless you have a tape measure. <laughs> And ever since then, then they started having different molds, you know, for so you can control the. We did it by tire pressure because uh, in those days we were still running the cross ply tire. It was before the radials, so pressure could really change the circumference. And then in Formula One, a lot of people didn't know, but I played with staggers in Formula One yeah. because they always favoring the quickest corner and then put cross weight the other way. And I used to have uh, this our guy with the three tapes around, you know, Formula <laughs> One, and, and uh, I had brought in uh, Kenny Shemansky. I had a specific tire guy from here that knew exactly what I wanted, and used to mark up all the tires, and why do you put set this and that? I said, you gotta be careful, I never told anybody why. And they said, why do you measure the tire? Because I want them to be exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the opposite. <laughs> oh, so, Mario. So, uh, oh. so let me tell you that. So, uh, so uh, and, and uh, they, they didn't have tree tape. The tree tape here, which is intense, which is that's the way they, they <laughs> yeah. measure. So I used to have this uh, tree tapes for these guys in Formula One. And uh, so some of the other teams uh, said, uh, can we get, can we get some of those tree tapes? He said, well, that, uh, Bob Dance, he said, well, they come from the States, you know, and, and Mario has them especially, <laughs> especially manufactured over there. And I mean, you could go to a, to a, a hardware store for 18 bucks. And, uh, and so the mechanic, I used to bring him over. He said, what well, can we get him? So I said, okay, so bring him over. So the, uh, the mechanics used to charge him 180 quid, 180 pounds. Yeah. You know, then they used to put that in the kitty for the, the year end party. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so coming back to the Indy 500. The what? Coming back to the Indy 500. I oh. think the first time it's ever been run in August. Um, but now having done a bunch of races, I think when the green drops, it still feels yeah. like yeah, it's, 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 it's still a race. It's Honor, still very you know, much a race. What, the what? most famous racetrack in the world. And, you know, it's uh, it's hard to take as veterans here seeing it this way yeah for but anyone roger penske has done a marvelous job in re rejuvenating this place and it you know that that alone and it makes you look forward to uh, 2021 because it's uh, yeah. you know it's going to be it's going to be good i think roger buying the series is saved everything best thing yeah. that could the best happen. thing i mean Probably not for him at this point, <laughs> you know, but uh, for for the sport, IndyCar racing yeah, and, yeah. and the Speedway and the series itself, uh, you, we could not have a better steward yep. in these difficult times. And uh, so again, in some ways, you know, there's challenging, but other ways we're blessed. And as you said, as far as the race is concerned, of course, 
you know, uh, I, I still think it's May. You know what yeah. I mean? It's, uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, I was looking at somebody's birthday and say, oh, yeah, it's right near, next, next to the race, you know. So, I, no, I mean, no, this is August. <laughs> <laughs> how, how was preparing for Indy different than the other races or Grand Prix or sprint car races? I mean, it's such a, an event that even used to be longer, right? A whole yeah, month. But, you know, yeah, yeah, but I mean, I think streamlining it like they did over time, that's a good thing because I think it was way overstretched. I used to say, you know, even back, back in the 60s when we were testing here, when it used to be two weeks before the first weekend of qualifying, we used to go out there and like, you know, and the first day we'd be top speed, you know, we had the best speed. So why are we here two weeks, two more you know? Weeks, yeah. But, but. For somebody like, say, Fernando Alonso, for instance, who comes out of Formula One, you know, hasn't that? It's golden because there's no other event in the world that will give you that much practice. So, any rookie that comes here that starts from the beginning, by the time the race comes along, you're almost a veteran. You know what you need to know. Yeah. You know, so it does have you know some value in that respect. Yeah. Um, you know, again, some uh, yeah. some drivers that probably never at the bin times they never drove an oval for instance they come from formula one they have the luxury of hours and hours and hours of yeah. practice and by the time the race rolls around man they know what they're doing yeah. you know so that's the beauty about this and the well, foot, then the, they the, get 500 miles to find out what they know well yeah of course <laughs> and yeah. the four corners are different aren't they yeah absolutely very different yeah it's yeah. different radius is different and just the, the bumps, the nature yeah. of each corner, believe yeah. me, it's got its personality. Plus, plus, especially if it's windy, oh, yeah. totally different again. See, like, the, yes. you know, it's, it's just, see that the flags right now, they're blowing exactly the opposite they were blowing on qualifying day. So if you're out there running, you know, you have to really readjust. You know, we always oh, yeah. go down the straightaway, you know, you look at the flag up there, you know, it's, it's got the wind sock, you got a wind sock in turn three, and you better pay attention to where that yep. is. Yep. Because at it, it, it top speed, when you're really trying to get every ounce out of the car, I mean, you better know how you're going to have to readjust your line. Yep. And, uh, and so, again, uh, there's a lot of tools you have in your cockpit, you know, that you can do, you know, cross weight and so forth, um, you know, but... Uh, uh, other than that, you know, that's it. It is what it is. Yeah, this, uh, the elements are really something important here. That this, uh, this racetrack can throw you curves like you have never seen before. I, when I was driving for McLaren with Tyler and I, and we, one day, we went out six times, starting in the morning and and right through to the end of the day and went out and had never touched the car it was a and it was different yeah. every mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. we went out there was something that out, outstanding that you you know so th this place is is it different than crazy. any other yeah, racetrack in the world it's very moody yeah. oh very cloud moody. cover temperature cloud cover, but but also also you have to try to understand sometimes that you cannot adjust the car for every condition no so yeah. sometimes it's the guy that's in the cockpit that has to adjust. Yeah. And that's some of the mistakes the that, that many make. You know, they figure, oh, okay, it's gonna be windy, so we're gonna do this, that setup. And that's gonna catch you up. Believe me, believe yeah. me. Yeah. You know, and I've seen that happen to everybody. Yep. You know, it just uh, seemed like, you know, you have so much engineering power, that even the engineers say, well, I gotta be able to help them, you know. So they have to feel they're contributing to something. And sometimes some of the drivers say, you know what, leave it alone. Yeah. I know what I got. I'll make up the difference if you feel that you're yeah. somewhere in the sweet spot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember End of story. when we were here with Fernando in 17, and I think it was like on the Thursday, it was terribly windy, and the drivers didn't want to go out. But Fernando asked, well, would we race in this wind? And the answer was yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. So we said, well, I need to go out and get the experience. And that was what's so impressive about Yes. Fernando's his yeah, preparation. As you guys know. Absolutely, he yeah, yeah. You he don't get to be world champion twice and not learn something, you yeah. know. It's, 
No, no, I, I was impressed. That, yeah. uh, right from the beginning, you know, I, I, nothing surprised me, you know, because he's uh, the ultimate professional. And I mean, he spent every minute of, of, of the, the 24 hours, you know, thinking what he could do. He was in a simulator in the morning. He was just doing everything possible to educate himself and feel like that's why in the first year that he was here, I mean, he was a, a force to be reckoned yeah. with in the race, yeah, no question. Yeah. He had the equipment, of course, you know, but he prepared himself properly and uh, he felt confident and that's everything, you know, uh, the speed that you're running here, especially in traffic. Yeah. Yeah. And mm. now everyone's saying the cars are going to be pretty hard to pass with the aero screen because of the disturbance in the air I guess we'll find out well someday. I think it's the other way the other way around I think uh, I think the way the flow actually closes up too early I mean much earlier behind the car mm. so you, you almost have to be right on the guy's gearbox to be able to really get some effect from mm. the from this the, the draft and um, so that's the difference and 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 if you're any distance behind you know, uh, you, you're not saving any fuel. A lot of time, you know, when, when you could just uh, follow somebody, you could just lift and save a lot of fuel. Now, I, don't, I think that part is out the window because once you're that close, you got to commit yourself and yeah. go. You know, you can't keep following the guy around his gearbox because your front end would be all over the place. Yeah. You know, so it's going to be an interesting mm. event. The, the, the aero screen definitely affected the aer aer aerodynamic the the way the wind you know is uh, is following you know the silhouette of the car that and the weight of it up <clears throat> well the, the weight is the top. weight is something mechanical you know mm. that's something yeah. that you know you feel it and of course you, you compensate you know the roll stiffness and all that but the the aero part because of the speed is more important in that respect because uh, you know uh, let's face it uh, the drafting here I mean uh, the slipstreaming is is everything at the speed and long straightaways but um, it's going to be uh, uh, now if you have four or five cars you know tight in front of you then you do have a bigger, bigger. you know bigger hole you know uh, so uh, a lot of elements there's a lot of things that you cannot duplicate during practice no matter what you do yeah. um, so uh, it's still in the race uh, every driver is going to find oh yeah well you know it's whoever can kind of uh, understand what's going on the best that's going to actually um, you know benefit from it from from it yeah. and we've got two exciting rookies yeah. Pato and Oliver what advice would you give them finish 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 yeah. the race it's a challenge <clears throat> and if you don't you know I mean if your car breaks then that's one thing but if you crash or get caught in a crash that sticks with you the rest of your until you prove it different yeah, yeah. and I you know finish and and have uh, patience you know you got to be patient yeah. and I always used to tell the rookies if I if I you know had the opportunity if you only think you can don't yeah you know mm -hmm. you just it's you know, a, you get in trouble. This sometimes place. Sometimes it's easier said than done, but uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> but you, you're you're very right. Uh, one one thing that uh, every driver has going for them is that the reliability of these cars, because of the rules, you know, in general, Formula One as well, is like it never was before because of the rules. It's designed that way, so technically you have the best chance. Of finishing the race if mistakes are not made you know it's very rare that an engine is going to go or something yeah. like that so uh, again that's the beauty like he says you know if the rookies uh, there are going to be a lot of surprises in the race things that you've never no matter how long you're here uh, you know practicing you're not going to be able to experience the same thing so have some patience but that's even for everybody a rookie is even more uh, to, to know that it's a long race and if you're all of a sudden beginning to really understand the situation halfway through, you still have a hundred laps to go, you know, yeah. and yeah. you can, you know, uh, make up anything that you think you might have lost. So uh, here the, the hopes are always there, you know, as long as you're in the race. Yeah. And the chances are that you probably, you know, you'll probably see 
out of 33 cars, maybe 28 cars were finished. Yeah. It used to be like 15, 16, you yeah. know, like after field used to yes. drop by the wayside. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's a different situation, but as you say, um, you know, we've, we've always been uh, obviously accused of not being too patient. Uh, which yeah, is that very is true. true. On occasion. You know, on only, occasion. On occasion. Yes, only on occasion. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, uh, uh, cool. Well, this has been, uh, this has been awesome. I love uh, massive fan and love talking racing. Well, I could do it all day. And uh, I know all the viewers will appreciate all the, mm -hmm. the insight. And thanks for sharing uh, oh, some, that, some brief stories. That's, that's uh, yeah. I think yes. special to all of us. You have and, a bed in there for us? Yeah, of yeah, course. There's a yeah. drop down. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. So thanks for, uh, thanks for joining me and uh, sharing some stories. Oh, Pleasure. thank you. It's, it's cool. been enjoyable. It's always good to be, be with my friends at McLaren. Yeah, absolutely.